Hello, everyone, and welcome to this AWN video series featuring a panel discussion with creatives from leading visual effects studio, Fuse Effects. I'm Dan Sarto. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief at Animation World Network, awn.com, and VFX World, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. We're going to be talking about some of the creative and technical aspects of visual effects production. Please join me in welcoming our two panelists. I want to introduce VFX supervisor at Fuse FX Los Angeles, Brigitte Bork. Brigitte, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having us. Pleasure meeting you. And I'd also like to introduce VFX supervisor at Fuse FX in Vancouver, Marshall Crosser. Marshall, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you both for being with us here today. And let's jump right into some questions. The projects you work on are extremely complex and exacting. You know, tell us a little bit about how you see your role in the visual effects production. Do you see it more artistic, more technical, a mix of both? Do they complement each other? Do they kind of fight each other sometimes? And do you find that there is room for your personal touch on the projects you're involved with? Uh, Brigitte, why don't we start with you? I would say the, the, the most interesting thing about uh, working on Lone Star is uh, a lot of it is artistic. Uh, the technical side comes from figuring out how to achieve the effects that they want within the time frame that we have. This particular show, it is a, a very compressed schedule. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of thought that goes into figuring out how to get the work done in that certain amount of time. And sometimes that, that, that amounts to figuring out different ways of doing something, maybe something a little bit more out of the ordinary. Marshall, what about, what about with you? Uh, you know, really, over the years, it just it depends upon the project. Uh, I was just kind of looking and doing a, a, a body count, so to speak, because uh, I think I'm sitting at about 63, 64 projects right now uh, that I've done since um, I think I started in 94. Uh, so every project is a little different. Some of them you, you really can roll up your sleeves and get in there and work with the, the showrunner, the director, the creatives on it. Uh, other shows, you're, you're more kind of following uh, specifically what they need. Uh, every show is a little different. Uh, something like uh, Upload that we worked on last year had a wide variety of stuff. It had some seamless visual effects, but it also had some visual effects that, that were kind of opening up uh, the world to you. Uh, so that type of stuff is, is something that's very enjoyable for me. Uh, you know, I enjoy the technical, but for me, the artistic and, and bringing in the ideas to the tables, uh, you know, to the table is uh, one of the best things in my mind. Um, for both of you, I want to I want to backtrack for a moment and, and let's I think it's good to, to really to kind of start. Take a minute and just tell me kind of what's the scope of your responsibility as a VFX supervisor looking uh, Brigitte for uh, for you with regards to Lone Star. And uh, Marshall, with regards to upload, give take you know what's a typical day? What are what's what are the main responsibilities that uh, for you on the show? Uh, well, for me, the main responsibilities would would be uh, like I said, coming up with ways to get the show done on time. Uh, it may be it's a lot of organization uh, for a show that turns around so quickly. Uh, if you're not organized, you're going to be in, in a lot of trouble. Um, it's it's getting all your ducks in a row, getting everything ready for when the work does come in and it's ready to be uh, worked on and completed. Um, a lot of it too is a lot of going back and forth and, and, and that, that speaks a little bit to the creative side, helping the client come up with uh, solutions when say, for example, they don't have the time or maybe they don't have the, the budget for doing the exact effects that they call for. Um, so that might in include doing meetings, doing side meetings, um, noticing that they're maybe doing a little too much in one area and suggesting that they go into a different direction, get the same result that they're looking for in terms of the story. Um, it, it's a lot of that. For this particular show, there, there's a lot of back and, back and forth and other shows, maybe not so much. They have the time, they're, they're a little bit more uh, compressed what their, what, what their expectations are. Um, that would be more like the show Empire that I worked on. Um, but a lot of that is a lot of back and forth with the director, the producer, even the DP that, that I've had uh, discussions with over certain things. So it's, it sounds like a lot of what you do is using your uh, expertise in the visual effects production 
to help the you know to help the director and 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 the filmmakers basically make creative decisions based upon what you think they can and can't do with the time and the budget. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes they might ask for something that maybe is not necessary. And if you come up with a different solution, like, look, I know this is the kind of disaster you're looking for, but maybe we'll do it in this other way. Uh, and it's something more attainable. It's something that we can do in the time frame. It's something that uh, you will get quicker and something that you will be just as happy with. And sometimes it's convincing them of, of that. It, it's almost like uh, a lot of these, these situations can be like a puzzle and you just have to figure out certain solutions for them to help them uh, attain their goal. Um, it, it, it just helps the whole process. I mean, everybody, everybody benefits from that, especially if you can, you can figure out exactly what they're going for and maybe come up with different ways of getting there. This is the, the basic it. idea. Marshall, take a minute and tell us what, what were the range and kind of scope of your responsibilities as a VFX supervisor on Upload? Yeah, Upload was, uh, was uh, season one was really good in the situation that we, we were given the script. Uh, we had to read it. We had to go through and break down uh, what we thought were visual effects or potentially visual effects. Uh, sometimes we would make a notation whether we thought it would be special effects, which would be, you know, the special effects technicians doing the work in camera on set. Uh, we would also have to figure out if things were going to be done uh, as they say, uh, playback, like on a, you know, a phone, whether they can play it back or whether we would do a burn in to that type of stuff. Um, so looking at that, we would have to just go through the whole script, make our assumptions, put a bid together, go into the production meeting where we discuss, uh, you know, run through the whole script with all of the key creatives and all the department heads and kind of hash out and make that decision what's who's going to do what. Uh, whether uh, something would be, you know, a visual effect or a special effect, a lot of times had to do with uh, the safety, you know, especially with stunts. Could, can stunts do this or is it too dangerous for that? So there's a lot of considerations you go through. Uh, once that's all dealt with, uh, at that point, you kind of had to give your, your wish list of everything you need, whether you need a green screen or a blue screen. And sometimes you have to make decisions uh, that particular moment. We had a particular case to where um, I had not seen the wardrobe that uh, one of the actors were going to be in. We were shooting outdoors. So in a general situation like that, we were blending with stuff that's green. So we called for a blue screen. So the actor comes walking out in a blue shirt, <laughs> which basically you go to do an extraction of a blue shirt on a blue screen, you're going to have, you know, a missing body. So we just had to have uh, little cards, uh, little flops available. We flew in a green right behind him. So at least we could isolate him out and, um, you know, kind of go with the flow on that. But basically from, you know, in this situation, so we'd go on set, we would shoot the stuff. Uh, the data was recorded. It came back into house. Uh, I would work with our in-house team and uh, supervise the work through there. Uh, through the CG soup and the comp soup to get everything disseminated and done, and then would present that work to the director. Let's let's Marshall. Let's dig in a little bit uh, um, more specifically with regards to some of the effects that you guys did um, on the on season one of Upload. Can you kind of summarize? I assume some of this stuff was potentially you know mundane lights like set extensions, and some of it was really really dynamic uh, with everything in between. Can you, can you give us a little breakdown of what some of the main effects were and kind of uh, working on the show uh, from the start to the finish? The pilot had already been shot and they had uh, kind of temporary visual effects in there. Um, they were really discussing whether they were going to readdress those as the show progressed. And, and as it progressed, they decided that they, yes, they did need to have to go back and reopen those. We did not work on the pilot, but we ended up redoing um, pretty much, I think 90, 95% of the work that was in the pilot was redone by us uh, to get it to the same um, kind of consistency throughout uh, all of the episodes. A few of the uh, kind of key moments was like in the pilot where we're driving down the freeway in the like self-driving car. And he is zooming in and out of crowds or traffic and stuff like that. And we talked about, 
you know, possibly having our LA office go out and shoot as backplates for it. But uh, we just determined that one thing, there was really no time you're we going to have a freeway that was clear enough to do that and then to choreograph the movements that they wanted to do. It just wasn't going to work. So we basically ended up just doing a virtual freeway sequence. So we could drive through, drive other cars and, and just build the whole thing. So when, when that sequence comes up, everything you see out through the windshield is all computer generated. And, um, you know, I think the only thing that was kind of real was the far mountains, which just happened to be from a photo that uh, I had taken um, when I was out at uh, out in the desert, kind of to give the hillside uh, that we could put back there. Another uh, big challenge that we were dealing with is uh, there was the handphone that was on all the time, pretty much a lot of discussions about that. You know, the the showrunner had a very specific. Um, kind of ratio he worked out with is the golden uh, rectangle. Uh, but that was the aspect ratio that he wanted all the phones. Occasionally he would change that up. So that was something we had to look at. Um, when people would appear and disappear, uh, every shot was a little different. We really had to sit down and analyze it. A few times we would just have everybody freeze in position and then walk the actor in and then you would pick it back up and then we would do cuts and, and alignments later in the composite to, to make that seamless. The only time that didn't work was that we were in the disco and the lights were all going and, and uh, I just said, I don't think this is gonna work. And they said, well, we wanna try it anyway. So we <laughs> went ahead and tried it. And everybody froze really well, but all the lights kept moving. So, so it was like, whoops, it didn't work. So they got creative and just had kind of had her end up dancing into the scene, which worked out great. Uh, the other big scene that took us some thinking about to doing was the travel agency. Um, they go into the room and the travel agent basically flips a switch and it's kind of like this poor man's virtual reality it pops up on the walls and, and he can, you can take you on these, like, here's Las Vegas, you can go there, here's an African safari. The only way we uh, could do it within, kind of stay within budget was basically we built two, ex or had the, you know, the uh, construction, they built two exact rooms. Uh, one was normal colors. The other one was, everything was painted blue in there even the desk, the chairs, and everything else. And then in order to us, for us to be able to get the outlines, we came in and we put green tape around the perimeter of all of the objects. So that then we could treat those edges so that when you look at it, you know, you see, you get the feeling of the, the environment that you're moving through, but yet you still get the hint of the internal uh, furniture and the, the other stuff in the room. Uh, so that was, you know, part of it. There was, there was a lot more stuff that we went through uh, but that gives you a kind of a, a general idea of, of the scope of the work. Wonderful. Um, Brigitte, let me, let me ask you, on Lone Star 911, you know, the show's full of natural disasters. Tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you faced with regards to creating them, and if you could focus a little bit on both the volcano eruption and the forest fire. you know they, they write the script they say okay here's the tornado coming up and then when they start shooting it it's it's kind of like almost uh, when you're on set you're also talking to them about so what do you envision here because once we get into post there's not a lot of time to to go back and forth and, and plan exactly what we're doing so we would do things for example the the tornado uh i had a discussion with a dp and i said well the biggest thing you can give me is interactive lighting so they built this lawnmower type thing that had uh, undulating lighting and they would just kind of push it around where the lava was coming. That was the sort of things we did. And also in that episode, we had um, the, the volcano pushed up a horde of scorpions. So we had to envision where these scorpions were going. The, the bones of the idea start in the script process, but then once we're on set, it starts developing further. 
And then again, once we get into post, uh, then it starts solidifying into exactly what we're gonna give them. Um, to develop the looks, we, we pretty much just, just show them some examples of what we're going for. And then we start implementing it. That one was a, a pretty wild one. Um, our fa my favorite one was definitely the wildfire. That was a lot of work out on the, on the hills talking to the director while he's shooting well what do you envision where do you envision this fire because you know you're looking at a hillside and you have a helicopter flying around and there's nothing there so you have to work out the choreography of where this fire is and where it's going the nice thing about that was uh when we when we got into post and i finally saw the edit uh, they shot so much footage i wasn't quite sure what to expect but once we have it what i usually do is i get the entire edit and I start spotting through it. I pick out the shots and I say, this should be a visual effect, this should be a visual effect. And I start marking it up. This is where I think the fire should be. This is where I'm gonna put it. We don't really have a lot of time to go back and forth. So there's a lot of decisions that have to be made uh, quickly. They have to be made decisively. Um, and that was a great episode because I do feel like uh, we had a lot of creative input about what the final product looked like. Uh, this is gonna be, directed towards both of you and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, one at a time. Unfortunately, we've been in a pandemic for um, close to a year now. And it's been, I won't necessarily say surprising, but it's certainly been, um, it's been great to see how quickly the animation and visual effects production space has pivoted and, and get this work done, get, get work done without missing a beat uh, on, on a whole host of, of uh, projects. Marshall, let's start with you. Tell me a little bit about how the transition to working at home has been for you and how has it been with regards to working with teams that you're used to just, you know, walking across the hall or walking across the room to talk to? I would say in the early days, it just was a little bit of a challenge getting used to uh, altering the communication a little bit. Uh, for myself, um, having worked at past companies where we were actually uh, partnered with, with companies in Singapore or China or India, I had dealt with doing remote sessions already with them and remote um, reviews. Uh, we would also have that uh, a lot of times in the past with directors who were not necessarily in the office. So, so for me, it just was kind of a natural progression. Um, where the kind of the frustration kind of comes in is if you've got someone who's struggling uh, to understand exactly what is being requested of them for the shots, it's, it's a little harder to read that. You know, when we do reviews right now, generally speaking, just due to bandwidth and everything, we don't have the Brady Bunch up. So we're not seeing all the faces. You know, for me doing, doing dailies in the office, you know, I am making eye contact with the artist and I can generally tell whether they're getting it or not and can, can elaborate upon it if necessary. So I think that's the one thing that's a little bit more difficult. And I really just miss the camaraderie. You know, I, we're all isolated in our, our own little bubbles here. And, uh, you know, periodically we'll just communicate with one another, just, you know, as if you were, were just bumping into them in the lunchroom, you know, we'll, you know, I'll period, periodically just call someone and talk to them and see how they're doing. So it's that type of stuff that I think is, is the difficult portion because this is a creative medium and just not having that interactive collaboration uh, is just a little, I don't know if frustrating is the word, but it just, it feels like there's just this little spark of creativity that's kind of gone. You know, we uh, we had a show, The Princess Switch, switched again. Um, they came in at, at the beginning of kind of last um, spring, summer, and, and we did the whole show, delivered it uh, from out of the office. So I think that was one of the first shows that I think Fuse had pushed all the way out, uh, all remote work. Uh, and, and it worked out great and everything. But like I said, I just, you kind of miss that, that camaraderie. Uh, the onset stuff we can go into later, but that's a totally different beast nowadays. Right. Well, you know, we love our pets and we love our kids, but sometimes there's no substitute for being with your colleagues when you're jamming on a project. And uh, um, it looks like we'll get back to that uh, soon enough, but it's, it certainly has been missed. Brigitte, what about you? How have you adjusted to working uh, from home uh, during this pandemic? 
Well, I, I think it's gone very well. I think with this, uh, this particular project, it's been easier for the client. I mean, uh, we would have, it's hard for them to even squeeze in the, the normal meetings that we need, the concept meetings and the VFX meetings. Now that because they can jump on the computer and have us all in the room together, it feels like um, we're able to communicate a lot more. I'm, e I'm able to show them stuff directly, especially if I have a shot that I wanna show them and, and talk about, and especially when time is of the essence, especially for, for this particular show. We'll go less than a week, we'll get the script and in less than a week, we're already shooting it. Uh, sometimes it's the day we start shooting, the script is finally finished. Um, but I feel because of the, also because of the hours, we do spend a lot of time with our colleagues in teams. Uh, that's our our face-to-face um, -face, uh, meeting room. We knew we know our crew very well. It's the we have the same people, so we know their abilities. So it's a little bit easier um, us for us to walk them through the particular shots. Artists giving them notes, helping them. And the one interesting thing is we work with our New York office, and because we're on uh, teams. We talk to them far more. We have a far, far more uh, FaceTime with them than we ever had before, and it does feel it feels more that uh, like the New York team is now in the same office as the LA team. We're a lot closer. We're working. Uh, we're, we're more collaborative uh, with with um, our people on the East Coast, and and I, I do find that it is it is a lot easier to jump on with the client and also the other people on on, on set when I do need to talk to them or I need to show them something or they can pull things up and you're right here, you know, if they show pictures or they show references of stuff, I could grab a screenshot and I could be talking to my own team on another monitor at the same time and saying, okay, you need to get ready for this or that. So I think for us, it's, it's actually, it's actually been pretty good. It's, um, it is a little harder with reviewing shots because you are, um, as Marshall said, you're, you're a little beholden to the the um, the slowdowns. Sometimes things would drop out, but for the most part, it's I've been pretty pleased with it. Um, I think most of my team has been pretty pleased with it. Uh, it has made the the flow of information go a lot faster. So I think that's something that I have embraced from this whole experience. So so all in all, I'm 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 pretty happy with how how things are going. Brigitte, this is this is uh, directed at you. Um, your background is in film, but you've been doing a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, in TV most recently. Other than finding the courage to do the same amount of work in a fraction of the time and for a lot less money, um, how, has, uh, how has your work in TV been informed, been made better, has been enabled by the great work you've done for many years in, uh, uh, in visual effects for film? I think you get used to working in film. You get used to a, a certain uh, a bar that you have to hit, and television has really has really come up in, in that in that uh, capacity. We're doing some really great work in television that has never been done before. I remember years ago, and it was almost unheard of back then. We were working on films, but we had one TV show that came in just for briefly, and. Um, it, it was very fast, it wasn't very refined, but now that's all changed. So I think the same kind of quality, uh, the same kind of thought go, that went into working on uh, films in the past is, is really, it's moved on to television. This, is really, this really is the golden age of television. The stuff that you're seeing on TV now is, is uh, most of it you can hold up to any film that you've seen previously. Um, so I, I think it, it, I think it, it, you'll find a lot of people that you work with, they all have a film background as well. Most, I mean, a lot of them, people that have been around for a while. Um, so I, I think, I think the, the transition that you're, you're, you would see just the quality, the, the, um, the, the attention to detail. I think that that has transferred to, to the work in TV these days. Let me, let me ask you just to follow that up. Do you find because the, the 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 schedules on TV shows, especially when you're working on episodics, where there's a tremendous amount of visual effects to deliver in a very short period of time compared to a film uh, schedule, do you find that the filmmakers and the creative folks are a little less demanding and a little more understanding of the fact that sometimes 
you're, there's no time to ponder it. You, you've got to kind of get down and dirty and get this stuff done. There is an understanding. I, I, I think uh, they're under the same gun that we are. They really need to finish their edit. They need the work so they can get sound um, moving. Uh, there is a little bit of an understanding um, and, and some are a little more understanding than others. Uh, but I think they all expect a, a, a level of quality you know, they, they expect something that looks fabulous. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons they, they, they come to Fuse is because they know that they trust us uh, to deliver that, 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 that level, level of quality. And I think we've proven it time after time. And, and it, you know, and the nice thing about that, especially when you have clients like our 911 clients, this is the second season of Lone Star, but it's the fourth season of 911. Uh, they trust us to the point that they say, okay, here, we need a volcano. Uh, let us know when it's done. And, and they, they trust us to do that. That's also good and bad because sometimes there's not uh, a lot of time to do the perfect tornado, but there is time to do something nice. And they know we're gonna give them something that looks fabulous. Your, your, your uh, exacting standards might even be greater than theirs as far as what you're gonna put together. <laughs> there are many times where you know they will final shots and we'll say, well, no, not quite. <laughs> And we'll send something later and say, no, well, we're going to make this a little bit better. And, and that, that happened when we were doing the wildfire is they would final some shots. But when we would, I would look at it in the cut, we would look at it and no, you know what? I think I'm going to change my mind. I think that's going to be a hillside full of fire instead of just smoke, that sort of thing. And they appreciate it. They really love the look of that particular episode. So I think we're, we're in a good spot. Uh, Fuse is trusted in that, in that respect. Marshall, I'm going to jump over to you. You're the you're you're as as you said earlier. You're you know as the grizzled veteran. Your long your long path through the visual effects uh, industry included a stop at uh, Industrial Light and Magic ILM. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to where you are today, uh, starting back as as a wee cub and and now as the uh, as I say the grizzled veteran that you are. <laughs> Oh yeah, it goes way back. I mean, I think if um, if I sit down and look at when I first started doing computer graphics to get paid, it was when I got out of uh, university in 1984. So I was working on a, a, a workstation called Genographics Workstation, and it was had been developed by uh, General Electric uh, for NASA in the 70s to basically do early simulations for the space shuttle. So uh, after it was built, they brought that out and it went commercial. And I think the, the machines that I was working on at the time, uh, just a single workstation was $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars, just uh, for this little thing that had, I think, 64K of memory and limited colors. So you had to get very creative when you wanted, you know, uh, fancy uh, illustrations. You actually had to physically break them up into multiple exposures and think about it, how you would do it if you were... Uh, cutting stencils and, and doing that type of silk screening. Uh, my background, uh, graphic design, uh, got a BFA in graphic design from uh, Missouri State University. I uh, uh, was an art major, but uh, could kind of see the way things were going. So I started taking programming classes uh, at the university. So started out with basic uh, language, uh, COBOL and assembly languages. So I understood computers coming out, uh, went ahead and took an extra semester for that reason. Had an internship in St. Louis, Missouri at a company up there that uh, it's called Design Network that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there again, we were doing the big multimedia shows, multiple banks of projectors, uh, also just general speaker uh, support slides. Decided I wanted to, to move, uh, move on and uh, move to um, California, uh, basically because I knew that uh, Industrial Light and Magic was in the Bay Area and moved out there hoping that someday I would get in. It took seven years, but got in there in, in uh, 1994 um, in the rotoscoping department and paint cleanup. So I uh, got a little bit of time in on Forrest Gump, didn't get credit, but the first main show I worked on was Casper, little guy here. <laughs> From there, I just worked my way up the ranks, uh, compositor, compositing supervisor, and then uh, was associate visual effects supervisor uh, on the last Indiana Jones. Uh, a few uh, commercials uh, supervised the work on that. And I uh, was there for almost 19 years and then uh, just decided, you know, after that amount of time, it was just kind of time to move on and ended up in Vancouver and have been working 
uh, up here. I moved up here in 2012, but primarily my transition, you know, went from feature films uh, towards uh, some network shows, but mainly uh, what a lot of the work that uh, the Vancouver Fuse office does is, is more of the streaming. Uh, so work for the major, major studios on that, which I kind of like because you're not quite under the same uh, pressure that you got to get this on the air like tomorrow. So you don't quite have that. So you have a little bit more breathing room. So it's kind of a nice kind of hybrid, I think, between, uh, you know, episodic and feature film. Uh, the streaming gives you a little bit more time to tell the story, uh, a little bit more time to kind of finesse the visual effects, uh, which is something that I, I really enjoy that aspect of, uh, about. And I mean, at Fuse, one thing that we, we definitely pride ourselves on is being collaborators. You know, we're just not a kind of a widget factory or a, a service bureau. Um, I think you can attest that you agree that, yeah, we, we're, we're rolling up our sleeves. We're in there with the clients. Uh, we work with them with their budgets. You know, if they can't quite afford what they're asking for, we can maybe find a more creative solution to get them what they need to tell their story. That's kind of it in a nutshell for me. Got it. I want to ask you some very kind of more direct, specific questions. And then maybe get a sentence or two answer. Question is, what one sentence of advice would you give to aspiring visual effects professionals? I would advise someone that wants to get into visual effects to find uh, a comfortable place to learn and, and uh, try to ingrain yourself in that company uh, and learn as much as you can. But I think finding a comfortable place is important. What about as far as areas of study or individual work to focus on? What, you know, what, what, if, if you were giving them an assignment of what to do as they are trying to get into the business or trying to expand their career, what would you, what would you recommend? I would recommend uh, for someone that wants to get into visual effects, I would recommend online tutorials. I would recommend uh, taking a lot of the classes that are available to you. Uh, I think that's a good start. And, uh, and self -ed self educating, self in finding, finding an area that you're interested in, and that's the area that you should follow. Marshall, how about for you? What, what would you, what, um... If you had to kind of give some bullet points with regards to advice to aspiring visual effects, you know, young professionals or folks that are looking to either move into the field or expand what they're doing in the field, what would you, what would you recommend? Well, the main thing to understand is just because you know a piece of software doesn't necessarily make you a visual effects artist. Personally, I think that you need to train your eye. And I think my art training brought that to my attention uh, I tell people, uh, shoot a lot of photography, uh, go out and capture the real world. Um, try to see uh, what is there so that you can replicate what's there. If you cannot see it, you cannot replicate it. Um, when it comes to making, making a visual effect, try to find real world reference. Uh, don't necessarily look at movies or things that have been done because that's someone's kind of interpretation of an effect. So it's kind of a Xerox of a Xerox. Next question. Uh, I, and it, it's funny because years ago at AWN, we used to do a monthly series. We called it the Desert Island series. And we'd get artists, you know, directors, animators. And we'd say, if you were, if you had, if you were going to be stranded on a desert island, what would be the 10 films that you would take with you or the 10 records or, or, or whatever? Um, we're gonna narrow it down a little bit, but uh, uh, Brigitte, I'm gonna start with you. If, you. if you had to say, is there one film that's your favorite film, what, what would you say that is? Uh, that is a hard question. And surprisingly, it probably wouldn't be a visual effects film. It would probably be, uh, one of my favorite films was Lawrence of Arabia. I love watching that. I love watching the, the just the cinematography is, is just amazing. And it's, 
it's a comfortable film to watch over and over again. And uh, Marshall, what about you? It's kind of a, a, there again, it's probably really not a visual effects type film. Um, Cinema Paradiso was one that really had a, a big impact upon me, just as far as uh, just the style of the filmmaking. Uh, Citizen Kane, you know, that's a classic. Um, of course, it's hard to bypass what really got me interested into this realm, which would be original Star Wars. Um, so, I mean, there's kind of the, the top three for me. Next question. If you had to peg the visual effects in a film or show that most, uh, that most blew you away, what would that be? I guess for me, it really has to go back to the earlier films that I saw when I was young. Because uh, the problem for me now is the cat's out of the bag. You know, uh, I see behind the curtain. So it's hard for me to be impressed by anything, uh, you know, that I see because, you know, anything's possible. Uh, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, there again, it, it goes to, you know, the first Indiana Jones, uh, the first Star Wars movies, uh, E.T. I mean, I saw E.T., in the theater in the sneak preview and I came walking out of there just blown away and you know went back to my place that I was working at the time and told everybody they have to go see it and they said what is it I said well it's E.T. well E.T. what's that E.T. the extraterrestrial oh that's a science fiction wow I said no it's more than that it's it's a heartwarming story so for me the 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 visual effects that help tell the story and help bring the world to life is what uh, excites me. I, I agree with you. I, I also look back at a film like uh, Forbidden Planet and say, unbelievable. It's like, I, I, I still can watch that and not feel like I'm, and feel like I'm in, uh, based in reality. Uh, Brigitte, now, now, you're under the, now, now you're under the gun. What about free? <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, when I did see Star Wars the first time, that was something that really affected me because it was just, it was so different. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I had just seen. Um, it, it did, it just, I remember it was the one film that I saw that I had to really think about what I just saw. It was, it was very amazing, especially for being so young. But besides that, it was the one thing that really made me want to go in, into film uh, was also the Indiana Jones, but also Dune. Dune was was a film that I really enjoyed, and that was something that I I really think the the visual effects helped tell the story. But I also have weird films, um, not weird. Life Aquatic. I love the visual effects in that film, just because even though they were, you would call them over the top, maybe, but they is out is. As over the top they were, they had the distinct um, they had the distinct purpose of telling the story, and they they did that so well. Uh, even things that even even though it wasn't realistic, it 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 was a, that's something that I do like. It tells the story. It helps push the story farther. It's not just about the visual effects. So those are the films that I think of when I think of visual effects. I will have to jump back in and say Blade Runner. Oh, Can't yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a given. You know, looking at, at Life Aquatic, how, how, can, how can you not love a film that has uh, David Bowie, acoustic David Bowie covers in Portuguese? Yeah. You know, it, it's, <laughs> exactly. Life Aquatic happens to be my, my kids, one of my kids' favorite films. And, you, know, it, you know, I also, I, I grew up watching Jack Cousteau all the time. So to watch that film was it was it was just like the perfect um, satire of or actually it, I guess it was honoring the whole memory of of that that particular documentary style, but yeah, I love that movie. Last question along these lines to ask you: Who who is there a dream director or a dream creative that you either would like to work with again, or if you haven't, would like to work with in the future? Oh, that's just. Oh, that's so difficult because unfortunately I've checked them off my list. Worked with Spielberg twice, uh, so it's it's hard to beat that. You know, uh, worked with George Lucas as well. 
just several directors. Uh, so for me right now, it's, um, I, I think the one that would be the most stepping out of my comfort zone would be Quentin because that's the style of work he does is not necessarily what I do all the time as far as photo reel and um, that type of stuff. He, he, he pushes things a little bit. Uh, so I think something like that, I, I think would be, would be good for me. Got it. What about you? If I had to pick one name out, it would probably be Wes Anderson, just for the same reason why I loved Life Aquatic. Um, it's, it's using visual effects maybe in a little different way than, than most people will, would think to. I don't know if it will ever happen, but <laughs> why not? Don't never, what do they say? Never say never? Never say never. Yeah, um, well, I think we've gotten to the point where we, we've, come, we've come to the end of our allotted time, so to speak. And uh, we, I, I, I could go on talking with you guys about your work literally for hours because I, I never, it, I'm, I'm, it never fails to amaze me to sit and talk about these projects because everyone is different. You, the same set of artists, the same set of tools, the same set of computers, every project is different and there's always great stories and great insight to share with folks like you who make this, as they say, you know, uh, make, make the visual magic. Um, Brigitte Marshall, I want to thank you for joining us here today and talking about this, the great work that you guys do and uh, that Fuse Effects does. I also want to thank Impact 24 PR and of course Animation World Network for putting this panel together and for everybody out there who is watching. I want you to stay tuned. We've got more segments uh, coming in this series. And again, for both of you, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having us. Yes, thanks for having us. Have a great day and stay safe out there.